Hello there everyone, I'm UXW Bill. Over the years I've had some people come to me and ask if I would put together a tutorial about an introduction to multimeter usage. How to use your multimeter, how to get the most out of it, that sort of thing. It's something that I've never felt tremendously compelled to do just because there are already so many excellent multimeter tutorials on YouTube and I just don't think that I would have anything significant to bring to the table in that regard. Maybe that will change at some point, but for now I present the next best thing, what is probably a totally foolproof digital multimeter. Of course I have to temper that by saying that just when you think something is completely foolproof, the world comes along and invents a better fool. However, I think that the Southwire company has definitely done it with this the model number 16030A digital multimeter. If you look at this you can see right away there's no control dial, control dial on the front. There's just three buttons. How could you possibly screw this up? But before we get into any of that I want to tell you that when I saw this hanging up in the store on the shelves and I took a look at it, its design brought to mind exactly one memory. <laughs> Of course, if digital multimeters had thoughts and feelings, they might well object to being told that they had a belly button. Belly button! Uh, uh. Regardless of whether you think this meter has a belly button or not, it has only three functions. AC and DC voltage measurement, ohms resistance, and a continuity beeper. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at the box and just see what some of the features are. I will say that there are a few things that come across as quite surprising here. First of all, this is a true RMS digital multimeter, which means that it's capable of giving you an accurate result on distorted AC waveforms, such as those that might be produced by a modified sine wave inverter. There's also mention of another feature here, although it has nothing to do with the measurement capabilities, and that's the presence of a work light. I have a multimeter that's a bigger brother to this, a Southwire 13070T, and I have to admit I find the work light to be enormously handy if only because none of my flashlights are ever in condition to do their thing when I need them. So I always end up grabbing that multimeter whenever I need a flashlight just because I know that it will work. And then finally, in addition to some safety certifications such as that from Underwriters Laboratories, which will try and get the candy ham to focus on here, there's also the mention that this is an IP67 waterproof multimeter. That's right, if you've really got a Jones to take your multimeter into the shower, throw it in the washing machine, or even take it to the beach, well, maybe you shouldn't take it to the beach. This is probably the model that you want to buy. We'll take a look at the back of the box where there's a table comparing all the various and sundry models. I'm sure that the video has enough resolution that if you want to read this, you can pause it and take in all the information in that table. I am surprised that this actually has a higher model number than some more capable meters like the 14070T and the 13070T, but apparently that's how Southwire decided to do it. Right away you can see that they include a set of test leads and remarkably, batteries are included, two triple A's. I really understand how batteries get to feeling it sometimes because <laughs> I'm rarely included in things either. <laughs> But while I'm trying to mess up my wonderful bedspread related backdrop here and knock everything over that's on the desk behind me, I will go ahead and cut this open. I could have gone and gotten a good pair of scissors to do this, but I was just too lazy. Alright, there we go. The box is open. It unfolds in a plastic clamshell. The first thing you get are the test leads. They're a little small, perhaps, especially for a guy who's got big old paws like myself, but they do seem to be pretty well made. I'm not sure these are actually silicon plastic, but they do feel like it. They've got nice little shrouds on them, which are required to be kept in place for this meter to meet its claimed Category 4 safety rating. And then, of course, we have these little plugs that connect to the multimeter's test jacks. And they have little plastic plugs in them. Another viewer actually told me that these do have a purpose. Amongst other things, they keep these test lead inputs from becoming squashed flat if you shove them into your toolbox somewhere. So although I had traditionally been throwing these away or leaving them on my electronic workbench to commingle with other lonely parts, 
it seems like there might actually be an argument for keeping them around. I'm going to change my position here because I'm starting to get a little stiff. Here are the batteries. These are your typical anonymous Asian batteries, but they are actually alkalines. GP. I never remember if that's Gold Peak or Golden Power. Both of those are definitely Asian companies that make batteries, and while these are not a well-known name brand, they are quite good quality. They work quite well, and it is nice to see them packed in. The instruction manual, which you're supposed to read, although I shouldn't be admitting to that because I might put myself in danger of losing my man card, is right here. It's a nicely done piece of documentation. Southwire actually had this written by a native speaker of English. And while I think there are one or two typographical errors along the way, it does tell you everything you need to know about how to use this meter. But even if you don't read the manual, you can probably get by just because this thing's functionality is so tremendously simple. Here's the meter itself. Probably easier to turn the package upside down to get it out than it is to do anything else. Comes with a little dummy display here. It'll be interesting to see in a nerdy sort of a way if all the characters they show are present in the display or if there are actually extra ones. There's an auto power off timer, high voltage indicator, flashlight, automatic hold, K ohms, ohms, mega ohms probably, millivolts, DC, polarity indicator, AC, and a low battery indicator that's a little hard to make out, at least on this uh, demonstration sheet that they attach to the display. These are, usually there's a pull tab on these somewhere that you can take off to help remove them. Of course, I'm such a nerd, I like to stick these things onto other things <laughs> in the house that have displays just to see if I can get a reaction from anybody. Of course, around here nobody cares. Probably wouldn't care unless it started the house on fire or something. All right, there we go. That comes off nicely. And then here on the back is the battery cover. And somewhere on the packaging, it actually says that there's an anti-theft device in the battery cover. And if you're a scofflaw like me, or a troublemaker, whichever one I said I was in the Walmart store tour video, have you ever thought of taking these things out of something and just sticking a whole bunch of these in your pockets and walking out of the store? Drive the anti-loss prevention people nuts. <laughs> the loss prevention people, I should say. Of course, not that I would ever advocate shoplifting. That's just plain wrong. Plus, you have to be in a lot better physical shape than I am to lift up an entire store. That's for darn sure. So go ahead and pop the batteries in there. I heard a beep. It powered on, and it powered on with a backlight, interestingly enough. I wonder if you can actually control the backlight on this, or if it's on all the time. Well, now that I've gone ahead and powered it up and put the batteries in, I think I'll take a look at the instruction manual, and I'll do some tests with this thing, just to see how accurate it is, and how well I happen to think it works. And to answer other questions that I have, like whether or not the automatic power-off timer can be deactivated, because that is one of my pet peeves with a few multimeters that I've had over the years. For some reason, you can't turn off the automatic power-off timer. So if you're going for a marathon measurement session, you're probably going to have to continually intervene and either press buttons or periodically turn the multimeter back on. I have no idea why the candy ham does not want to focus without a little bit of encouragement. But even if I override it to use manual focus, it still won't comply. And yet if I cycle the zoom lens just a little bit, works fine. Who knows? Now some of you in the viewing audience are probably wondering why I referred to this multimeter as being foolproof. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that there are only three testing ranges, AC and DC voltage, ohms resistance, and of course a continuity beeper. But Southwire actually goes a little bit further than that. If you notice right here on the front of the meter above its belly button, it says auto-selecting. That refers not only to its automatically determining whether you're measuring alternating or direct current voltages, it also means that if you have the meter set to the wrong mode of operation, such as ohms resistance when you intend to be measuring voltage, it will switch its operating mode accordingly rather than stressing its protective hardware or blowing up like a cheap multimeter would do. 
So we'll take a look at the feature set here. I did play around with it a little bit and there does not appear to be a way to shut the display backlight off. Nothing is mentioned in the instructions. And I also found no way to defeat the automatic power off timer. So I think that counts a little bit against it. When the meter powers up, it comes up in the alternating current measurement mode as indicated by the wavy line over here. If you push the button again, it switches to ohms resistance. And then finally it switches to the continuity beeper, which is indicated by a little radiating waves icon in the upper right hand corner of the display. And then it switches back to AC voltage once again. I don't have anything handy with which to test alternating and direct current detection up here. Southwire says that the threshold for mode switching is somewhere around 2.7 volts either alternating or direct current. And I would have to wonder how this thing actually determines which sort of a waveform it's looking at and whether it might have some trouble if, say, an alternating and direct current signal were both running on the same wire that you were making a measurement of. But if you were doing that, you'd probably buy something a little bit better than this. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to test the foolproof nature of this multimeter right now by doing something that is incredibly dangerous. You should never do electronics work on your bed. Remember folks, UXW Bill is a professional bad example who operates on a closed course. We get the outlet strip out here if I can actually find it while I remove about a million tons of junk from under my bed. Here's the outlet strip right now. And if I haven't just pulled the plug out of the wall behind the bed, We'll go ahead and we'll make our hook up here. You can see that a red light came on at the top. There is a non-contact voltage measurement function. But it went beep and it switched over perfectly to measure AC voltage. No incendiary action or fireworks. It just quietly worked. So that's pretty impressive. And that's the other reason why I called this multimeter foolproof. Because even if you do it incorrectly, it will save you from yourself without having to damage any of its protective hardware or put the operator at risk. Spoiler alert, I already know from having taken this apart between video takes that it is in fact a true RMS multimeter. But for those of you who are watching out in YouTube land, I've gone ahead and hooked it up to this uninterruptible power supply having what is optimistically referred to as a modified sine wave output, which is really a square wave with periodic drops to zero level before the polarity of the waveform reverses and goes the other way. Anyway, we'll go ahead and turn this thing back on here, and as you can see, once again, I've got the meter in the improper mode of operation. It's interesting to note that the non-contact voltage detection works, or at least it worked until I touched it. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. The backlight just turned itself off, which is certainly interesting. But it switches itself to the proper mode and indicates a plausible voltage figure. So this definitely would appear to be functioning as a true RMS multimeter. There is no separate key by which the backlighting can be turned on, but if you turn on the flashlight, which casts a pretty good beam, if the backlight is not already on, it comes back on at the same time. This test will ascertain not only the accuracy of the Southwire multimeter's resistance testing range, but how quickly its auto-ranging function settles onto a stable reading. Since it is not possible to select a manual resistance measurement range with this meter, it's very important that the automatic resistance ranging work quickly and accurately. Now you've probably noticed that these are only 1% accuracy resistors. They do, however, exceed the accuracy specification as indicated by Southwire for this meter. They indicate a reading containing a maximum 2% discrepancy plus 10 counts. So these resistors will definitely exceed the accuracy specification of the meter as indicated by its manufacturer. We'll get the tests underway here. We'll put one ohm on the scale and the meter indicates that it's right on the money. So we'll step things up to 10 ohms. And again it gives a reading that is just spot on. Go up to 20 ohms, 19.9, that is certainly well within the tolerance. We'll go up to 30 ohms, and again, very much within tolerance, all the way up to 40 ohms. I have yet to notice any overshoot in the auto ranging and detection of resistance. I do notice, however, that it usually takes about two or three updates of the display before the correct resistance is ultimately displayed. 
We'll take a wild step up here. We'll go up to 4k ohms worth of resistance. And it was very quick to auto range with basically no overshoot. And once again, it is certainly well within specification here. It is here that I have to note a little bit of disappointment with this meter's capabilities. According to Southwire, once again, the maximum possible resistance range that you may test, the maximum possible resistance value, I should say, is 400k ohms. Even the cheapy DT830 based multimeters can do far better than that, with many of them being capable of testing up to 2 mega ohms worth of resistance. But it appears that it certainly will go up to that limit, but not beyond it. So it is rather limited in its ability to measure resistance. And that may have something to do with the design of the circuit and the auto detection of resistance versus voltage measurement mode. Speaking of voltage measurement, let's go ahead and make some voltage measurement accuracy tests and also see if the threshold of voltage detection is as Southwire indicates it to be at 2.7 volts AC or DC. Here's a test to try and determine if Southwire's published specification about this multimeter's auto changeover capability is in fact accurate. We have the variable regulated DC power supply here. You can just barely see its display. And we also have a reference multimeter here just to keep tabs on the voltage because this thing's metering is not the most precise in the world. As you can see it's reading completely zeroed out over here. But the little Anang meter definitely sees a little bit of voltage. And this of course is in the resistance measurement mode. So we'll start cranking things up here. And we'll just see where the switchover does happen to take place. We're at half a volt right now, a little over that actually. Almost to one volt DC. One and a half volts DC and still no switchover. And right there at 1.6 volts approximately, it's switched over to its DC voltage measurement mode. I really have no idea why the non-contact voltage detector seems to be going gaga over various sensors. It's like it's pulling readings out of the air. There's nothing actually near enough to that to be tripping it off. I have now connected a precision voltage reference to the meter set for 10 volts DC. And that is exactly what it is reading. Now 7.5 volts DC. 5 volts DC. And now the one that I suspect might give it a little bit of trouble, 2.5 volts DC. You'll notice that again I've set it to the resistance measurement mode. Turn the reference on here. Nope, it worked perfectly. I'm impressed. Voltage symmetry test, 2.5 volts DC, polarity reversed. 5 volts DC, polarity reversed. 7.5 volts DC, polarity reversed. 10 volts DC, polarity reversed. Now it's time to make some tests with AC voltage. There are two things that I'm looking to determine here. Where exactly the south wire multimeter cuts over from its resistance measuring mode to the voltage measurement mode, which is what this second multimeter is for. It's here as a reference so that we can see the level of voltage being output by my variable auto transformer before the south wire meter does in fact switch over. I'm also curious again about the speed and accuracy of the auto ranging functionality. So we'll set this to its resistance measurement mode and we'll get started. Switched over almost immediately at about 1 volt AC. So we'll turn it up. It's very quick to settle on a reading here. And there's that non-contact voltage detection going nuts again. I suspect it's really far too sensitive for its own good or that there's some leakage or radiation from the meter circuit board that's tripping up the sensor that's utilized for non-contact voltage detection. You'll also notice that when particularly high voltages are being measured that a little lightning bolt symbol appears in the display presumably to remind you that you should be very careful working around such voltages. So we'll take the variable auto transformers output down. 
And again, it's very quick to follow along. It seems to work very, very well. Let's go ahead and make a quick test of the Southwire meter's flashlight. I've turned out the lights in the laundry room and I'm getting ready to unscrew the bulb in here. Now you can see that everything is completely dark. So we'll go ahead and push the button that turns the light on. I think you can see that while it's a pretty tightly focused round beam, it seems to do an exceptional job of lighting up the room. As I said previously, the 13070T, this thing's bigger brother in terms of functionality, is a meter that I end up using all the time as a flashlight just because none of my flashlights are ever up to the challenge. This is just another test of the Southwire meter's flashlight functionality. It's very dark back here by the electrical panels. I can see it better than the camcorder can, but it's still dark enough that some extra light would really help out and uh, shed some light on things, if you'll excuse the very unintentional pun. So we'll go ahead and hit the button to turn it on here. And once again, it really does do a superior job of lighting things up. I'm very satisfied with its performance in this regard. And then, of course, there is the non-contact voltage detection functionality, mentioned several times throughout the course of this review, but this will be the first time I've actually put it to a proper intentional test. Here again, we'll turn the light back on so we can actually see what we're doing, and no, those circuit breakers are not actually tripped. They just look that way because the camcorder is sitting relative to them at a very sharp angle. This meter does not require that its test leads be attached in order to use the non-contact voltage detection capability. In fact, if you buy one of these or look at pictures online, you'll see there's a little protrusion from the top of the unit, and that represents the non-contact voltage detection antenna. So we'll bring the meter in for the kill here. And it would appear to function, but it definitely does not have a lot of range. some of these, all of these circuit breakers are live and it's not actually detecting anything reliably on the last two, so yet again I find this feature to be of exceedingly limited usefulness and as always I strongly encourage you to test a circuit before you ever rely on what's indicated by any kind of a passive tester that's not directly connected such as a non-contact voltage detection device. Now, I strongly suspect that the burning question on most people's minds who happen to be watching this review has to do with whether or not this meter is really waterproof. And that's exactly what we're going to find out. We have here its uh, more featureful brother, the 13070T model meter, and it is definitely considered waterproof, but there is a qualifier. You have to use Southwire supplied test leads and you also have to make sure that this rubber bung is in the test jack that's not being used. Otherwise water will get inside and your meter will have a bad day. But it is most definitely waterproof. This one on the other hand, the test leads don't look to me like they make any kind of a particularly watertight seal. In fact, I have to wonder if these are really the test leads that are intended to go with this meter. Maybe there was a running design change somewhere along the way, because it seems like they're kind of small to fit into the holster there. But I wonder if these have to be present for it to be waterproof. I thought about this very carefully, and then I decided, what the heck, we'll run the test without the leads in place. As I said previously, I've had this apart and I strongly believe that these are pretty much completely insulated from the environment. So what we're going to do right now is just exactly what you think we're going to do. This bad boy is going in the drink. Just like that. I'll return in about a half an hour from now with the results. I try to learn at least one new thing every day, and tonight I've learned that an inverted styrofoam Pepsi cup really does not make for a very good drain stopper. And the things I resort to when the drain stopper has fallen down behind the wall, and I haven't felt like taking the time to fish it out of there just yet. So, here are our two meters. I'll go ahead and let the rest of the water drain away. And even though this is not the one that's under review, yep, still works just fine. 
Let's go ahead and try this one and see what happens with it. Comes right up. Seems to do everything that it's supposed to do. So it's pretty hard to argue with that. I'd say it passed that test of flying colors. Now, of course, it should be said that if your multimeter should get wet, you should dry it off thoroughly before you start operating it. Here we are looking inside the multimeter after the water test, and I'm pleased to report that it passed with flying colors. I had expected that there might be some issue with the ingress of water around the test jacks, but they are high and dry, as is every other major part of the multimeter. Even the battery compartment stayed completely dry. I suppose that's the part that most of you, especially those of you who are looking at buying your first ever multimeter, are the most interested in. But for those of you who are simply curious or have a more technical mindset, well, I've got it apart. I figured we'd also take a look at some of the other components in here, the overall design, and what parts the designers decided to use. We'll get our start over here at this corner of the circuit board, where the meter's protective hardware is located. We have three green components right here, all of them covered in black heat shrink tubing. These are positive thermal coefficient, or PTC thermistors. When these are connected across a source of electrical energy, they heat up and their resistance increases, hopefully protecting whatever load is located downstream from them. They are encased in the heat shrink tubing in case they fail violently. And should they fail to suppress an excessive level of electrical energy being applied to this meter, you have these blue components next door. These are metal oxide varistors, MOVs, or as some people pronounce it as a word, MOV, although I've never been able to bring myself to do that. These are the components that are found in almost any surge suppression device that you can buy. And they do a good job. They're cheap and effective. Really, the only bad thing about them is that every time they absorb an excessive amount of electrical energy they deteriorate and eventually they reach the point where they no longer work. I am greatly pleased to see that the circuit board underneath these has been cut to try and prevent issues with arc over and flash over in the event of excessive levels of electrical energy being connected to this meter. So that's the majority of the protective hardware right there. We move our attention over here to this eight-legged dual inline package chip with the Matsushita logo on it. This is actually a solid-state relay, and it is very likely the heart of this meter's ability to automatically change its range of measurement from resistance to voltage when, in fact, there is a voltage applied. I have not tried to trace, and I suspect it would be quite difficult to see what actually results in the switch being made because this is a multi-layered circuit board. That is to say that there are conductive planes on different levels, some of which are obscured by higher up levels like the traces you see running across the top here. But my guess is that this transistor right over here, based on reading the data sheet for this part, that this transistor plays a key role in switching that relay so that the appropriate mode of measurement is selected. And speaking of measurement, the final component is the oh-so-ubiquitous... I wish I wouldn't have screwed up the Handycam's focus there. We'll see how close we can get. DreamTech International DTM0660L digital multimeter on a chip. It has a little clock crystal sitting over here. There's a piezoelectric squeaker can over there and a whole slew of other supporting components present on the circuit board as well. This chip is really rather terribly underutilized in this design because it supports making all manner of measurements. Diode tests, capacitor tests, temperature, and quite a few more beyond that. It's really very flexible, highly programmable, and it's kind of a shame to see it put to use in a unit where its full capabilities will never be recognized, but that just so happens to be a pet peeve of mine. So those are the internals of the meter. They look pretty good. I see that there's been a pleasing amount of attention to detail. If you look at these the connectors that have been attached to the battery compartment, you can see that they've been covered very nicely, very professionally in heat shrink tubing. I suspect that was done by hand as the meter moved down the assembly line. This other set of leads over here goes to the built-in LED flashlight. And of course, all of those plug into the circuit board. I do notice with some degree of interest that while the battery connections appear to be soldered to the board, well, I say that, now that I look more closely, there is what could be an outline for a connector on the other side. 
I'm not going to take the circuit board out to find out, but the backlight is actually plugged into the board, so I suppose if it failed and you felt that you could locate a suitable replacement LED, that maybe you could even affect some sort of repair yourself. If you do buy this multimeter and elect to take it apart yourself for any reason, make very sure that you do not lose any part of the screws that hold it together. There's a little rubber gasket in particular that must be kept in place in order for this meter to remain waterproof. If you lose that, the game's over. It'll still work, but you shouldn't try getting it wet. So here we are at the end of the review where it's time for me to tell you what I thought of this product and whether or not I'd recommend that you actually buy it. Would I recommend that you buy the Southwire 16030A, especially if you're looking for my first multimeter? Well, yes, I think actually I would. Unlike a lot of the most cheap and suspicious multimeters out there, it seems highly likely that this one does meet its published category safety rating. It's also listed by the underwriters laboratories, which should help to further assure that it is safe. I feel that you'll probably run into its limitations rather quickly, especially if you get serious about a hobby in electronics, and that eventually you would probably want a multimeter that was capable of a lot more. But if you're not sure what you're doing, and you want a meter that'll hold your hand while you get a feel for how one of these is to be used, I think this could be a good choice. And it's not bank-breakingly expensive either. You can buy this meter for around 45 United States dollars, sometimes a little less if it happens to be on sale, or you have some kind of a bonus or benefits card from the people that are selling it. And of course, if you should discover at some time down the road that you'd much rather have a far more flexible multimeter than this one, it's not like you'll have spent all your money. You'll have some left over and you can look toward getting a much better model. So thank you as always for watching. I certainly do appreciate it. And as always, I'm interested in hearing your constructive viewpoints and commentary down in the comments area.